Thank you, everybody. Um, like Wendy said, my name is Alicia, and uh, I'm Alexis Wozniki. Thanks for having us. And we came prepared to introduce everybody broadly to TerraCycle. Uh, as Wendy said, we're based in Trenton, in New Jersey. Um, and so we'll be kind of focusing on our three main lines of business, which are essentially what you see on the, the slide up now, which is making everything recyclable. Um, how can we integrate more recycled content into the things that we consume every day? But ultimately, how can we eliminate the issue from the cause and design into a better, more sustainable, circular future? Um, so I'm going to send Lexis to sit so she can click through, and I'll kick this off. But so this just to give everyone a, a visual representation of where we're working. Um, Tom Zaki, our founder and CEO, actually started the company in Princeton, uh, just not too far away at the university, making uh, compost and kind of uh, starting a consumer packaging good company. I'll pass this around. Um, hopefully, it can make the rounds. But um, really focusing on vermin composting and, and um, finding value in the organic waste at, at Princeton University. Um, but really pivoted after using, reusing packages, right? Using old Pepsi bottles and, and any kind of, uh, of reusable bottle um, to really focus on well, how, how can we find value in all of the things that we currently are throwing away, right? Why is it that some things are recyclable while others aren't? And how can we kind of find creative ways to, to encourage more of that? So our first focus area is really looking at this model, what we live in today, which is very linear, right? Like take, extract, make, uh, and then send to landfill or incineration at best, right? But over litter. And how can we shift into, you know, use, keeping those materials in our economy and recycling them, right? So, come on, Lexus. I think it's very important to understand before appreciating what TerraCycle does, what the answer to that question. Why are some things recycled while others aren't? And I think very clear, like we exist now, as you saw in 21 countries across the globe, recycling things like dirty diapers, uh, cigarette butts, flexible plastic, everything. Um, it's not a matter of science or technology. I think that's the key thing. Um, we can turn something into something else. Where there's a will, there is ultimately a way. But it's a matter of economics. If you think of your typical curbside recycling, you can throw something like an aluminum can or a clear PET bottle in because the inherent value of those materials more than cover the cost to collect and aggregate and sort and push push those materials out to a very complex global supply chain that will essentially process those things and turn it into something new. So much so that you can profit off of doing this, right? Until recently, we know that this entire industry is in flux. Um, but TerraCycle, we've always really focused in on everything you see on the right-hand side of this Venn diagram, where those economics just don't hold up, right? If you think of um, toothpaste or beauty products or things like cigarette butts, it's, it's more expensive to recycle that than, than it's ultimately worth. Um, so we really do this, um, go ahead, Lexus, uh, for we've been able to grow the business um, by, by finding creative ways to essentially allow folks to recycle these materials in partnership with CPG companies or various stakeholders that essentially fill that gap that we were just talking about, partly because people care about this issue, right? Like we're part of why you've invited us here today, Wendy, is because it's, it's top of mind. Um, and it's interesting when you, when you ask people, what do you care most um, when it comes to the sustainability of the products that you're consuming, there are a lot of other decisions companies can make further upstream, like what is your renewable energy usage and what, how, what's the overall carbon footprint of your upstream supply chain that the everyday consumer just doesn't, you don't get that. You don't think of that at the point of purchase. But really, you know recycling something feels much better than throwing something away, right? So I think we've, we've been able to tap into that truth, right? Um, go ahead, Alexis. And, and coupled with the fact that, yeah, people are waking up to all of these issues. 
um, that it's, it's in the news, we're, being, we're very aware of the amount of waste that's in our oceans, in our natural environments, um, th that we've been able to form partnerships with organizations, go ahead, um, all different shapes and sizes, as you can see, um, from the number one or number two company in a given category to, I, I'm in the, on the business development side, actually, um, at TerraCycle for recycling, so even we're getting calls nowadays, people that are pre-market, you know, trying to launch a product with a fully thought out kind of downstream um, solution in place. So we've been able to do this because the, aside from the fact people care about these issues, the way we've been able to grow and, um, and foster these partnerships is because the way TerraCycle solves for these materials is designed in a way to give value to the stakeholder that's funding the actual recycling, right? So whether it's being able to claim that your packaging is nationally recyclable through TerraCycle, which is massive, but maybe it is tying kind of the goals of a recycling program to driving things like positive brand perception or tying it back to sales. Because I think what I've learned uh, since finishing school um, and th really thinking about sustainability as a concept, it has to align with your, the bottom line business strategy, right? Like doing something because it's the right thing is not going to be sustainable long term in a, in a capitalistic driven society, right? We, the, doing the right thing has to make sense from a business perspective as well. Um, so we, we wanted to show an example of a, a partner of ours that has been highlighted very recently, I think, in case anybody uses contact lenses out there. Um, but that gosh alone, they've uh, been highlighted for a number of, um, over the last few months in a number of articles because they run a recycling program through TerraCycle that is free for anybody to, to participate in, to send in um, any and all contact lens waste. Um, and they've been highlighted as a, 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 a leader in the space for, for doing so, right? So they've been growing that partnership. Um, but so just to kind of dig into, well, how, what does this mean? How do we recycle um, these kind of weird to recycle things in partnerships with brands? It's essentially a three-step model. It's how do we physically collect the waste back from consumers? Um, what's the technical solution for doing something like cigarette butts, etc.? cetera? Um, and then how do we partner with these organizations to engage with people to drive collections, right? But also drive at the types of value that I was just kind of alluding to, right? To make it make sense um, from a business perspective. So. The collection piece, you can see just some folks participating in the programs, but go ahead, Lexus, next one. Um, there, there are many different logistical models that, that TerraCycle runs. I think we, we chose to focus on two here. Um, one where that is brand sponsored, right? Where um, say we work with Colby or we work with Febreze, uh, a, a number of different partners. Um, they can es essentially sponsor a national recycling program that's accessible to anybody in the United States um, that's essentially through this mechanic here. You learn about these programs, so I'm ho hopefully when you're pushing out all of this information right after after the meeting, so if, if you're interested in, in recycling through the free programs, you go to terracycle.com, you sign up um, to start collecting, you can use any box that you have at your location, essentially, to get whatever material it is that's uh, accepted through your program. So maybe it's contact lens waste, maybe if you have dogs, we run a number of pet food packaging um, part programs. Um, once you're kind of filled up in that box, you can go back to the website, download a prepaid, pre-addressed shipping label that's essentially sponsored by the brand. Um, you send that into TerraCycle, and we recycle 100% of what we receive. Um, and further, some of those programs actually do have a, an incentive piece baked in, so you can earn points that you can donate uh, to charitable causes, mm -hmm. including Friends of Princeton, Princeton Open Space. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 so just to show, like, what does this actually look like, right? Because how, how, does, how does something like this scale? That, and that's a question we get a lot. And that it's, it's interesting because what we've seen in running these programs, specifically the recycling programs, there's always a few people that become very engaged with the fact that they can recycle something they had to throw away. I mean, look at Capri Sun Dress Lady here. I mean, she did that completely unsolicited. Um, 
which is what incredible. Is she so she made a dress out of Capri Sun pouches. Oh, <laughs> so these people will start to kind of set up these these, pub, these collection locations. Maybe it's at a school. Maybe it's in an office or at any anywhere these products are consumed, where you're essentially letting people know, hey, bring in your bring in X Y Z, you know, packaging. Which, from a brand's perspective, then you have people talking about your recycling program, the, the your brand. Um, so that's that's one of those kind of returns, um, and so that can come to life in so many different ways. We have. Um, some some public drop off points in certain programs, right? As as they become more and more uh, used, and and you have those public collection locations that are interested in being uh, findable, right? So we we highlighted the the Bausch and Lomb program is one where you can search on a map and find any anywhere close by where you can drop off that type of waste. Um, uh, Subaru is another great example. They have a, a few different drop points for, for different types of material. Um, but, yeah, and, but we also wanted to show another example because, fun, really, as I've said, the, the issue of recyclability is about cost, right? Today it's more expensive for the, the city of Philadelphia to recycle, so we might as well burn it. That's, that's the attitude today. Um, but we do have other options where the consumer can fund recycling. So we have a zero waste uh, platform where you can essentially buy boxes that have all of the costs associated with shipping, processing, logistics, etc. rolled up into the purchase price of the box to solve for anything like nitrile gloves. That's a big one in, in that line of business. These are um, nitrile gloves and process to to um, chip bags or, or and any anything, even hair. We have one, I had a question the other day for hair salons, interested in making sure. But anyway, so uh, yeah, so that, that's kind of how the collection piece can come to life. And I'll let Lexis come on up, she's gonna speak to this part. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to talk a little bit more about how we really solve for this waste once we're aggregating all these diverse kind of materials. Um, so number one is our um, check-in process. So using these um, prepaid shipping labels, we're able to um, identify what kind of waste stream is in all these different boxes uh, and then kind of aggregate like material together. So um, our chip bag programs, our energy bar wrappers are all this kind of flexible plastic packaging. Um, so we're able to aggregate all that until we're able to um, uh, warrant a processing run, which is where we um, go to a third-party processor with these um, solutions um, on how they can recycle this waste, and then they're transformed into new materials uh, to be used. Um, starting with these plastic pellets, so a lot of our pro um, programs are collecting um, plastic-based products, which are then turned into these plastic pellets um, to be reused um, to make anything from um, outdoor chairs, tables, uh, siding for houses, kind of sky's the limit. So we've included a few examples. I'll also pass these around. Um, so number one being um, our flexible plastic packaging, which is in this. So this is very much, if you look on the inside of you know, a Capri Sun pouch, this looks exactly like it. So first, um, the material is um, shredded and cleaned, um, and it comes out looking like that. Uh, and then we take it to our processor, which transforms it into, right here, drain pouches, um, these uh, plastic pellets, um, which are then taken to manufacturers to create new products. Alexa, yes. For those of us who may not consume Capri Sun, would you mind telling me what it is? <laughs> they are amazing. <laughs> we actually don't partner with the Capri Sun anymore, um, but Capri Sun, like any kind of um, those little drink pouches that you see little kids drinking, yeah, um, those little one-time use um, flexible plastic pouches with the little straw. That's what we're talking about here. Um, but they could really apply to any kind of single-use packaging, so your energy bar wrappers, stuff like that. Uh, so what we can do with these tools, as I mentioned, is a lot. We can make tons of products out of them, um, and brands are actually leveraging this to create smart products. So products that tie into their business goals or um, even closed-loop solutions. So I'll talk about our co promotional um, tools a little bit later, um, but as I mentioned, closed-loop, so um, promotional products that tie into their uh, original products. So um, this is an, an example of Expo. They created... Um, uh, marker trees for blackboards out of their um, recycled marker waste, which was really cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to jive into it. Um, and then they're also able to engage consumers through this program because everyone loves seeing closed loop solutions, seeing how their waste can impact society on a greater level um, and the impacts of their recycling. Uh, so some ways they do this is incorporating products um, as is. So this is some example we do with um, Earthborn Holistic. Um, they create upcycled products out of um, pre-consumer packaging. So packaging that, you know, they may be changing their packaging design. They have all this leftover plastic. What can they do with it? Um, typically the answer was send it to the landfill. But they can actually get a ton of value from this because their um, branding is all on the the packaging um, and they're able to create really cool products for um, promotional use at you know retail or consumer promotions and stuff like that. Um, we've also included this this example. This is our um, Townsend Maine backpack. This is actually made out of um, toothpaste wrappers. So pre consumer toothpaste wrappers, um, but it's toothpaste wrappers nonetheless. Uh, and super uh, cool and a fun way to message like the recyclability of these programs. Um, and another example we also included of Tom's of Maine, this is their um, trade booth. Um, TerraCycle created these lamps. Um, if you look here, these are actually the tops to their um, toothpaste containers. So a really cool way to um, save things out of landfill and message the recyclability of these programs. Um, another way they're able to um, incorporate their recycling programs um, to grow value is um, at retail. So through retail promotions we run, um, these are examples with um, Colgate for Breeze and uh, we had a promotion with Coors. Um, they've communicated, communicated um, the recycling program at retail um, for different promotions that have um, closed loop endings. So um, as I, you saw in the previous slide, um, Garnier creates uh, garden beds out of their uh, product waste. Um, Colgate creates entire playgrounds, which they donate to um, different communities. Um, and Febreze also has um, in-store recycling. Um, so this is diving in just a little bit deeper, as you can see, uh, the per, uh, playgrounds um, made out of, um, this one is an example of um, Febreze with PNG of a play uh, playground that they donated, um, as well as the Garnier Garden Beds, which they run as their annual volunteer day uh, giveaway, where all their um, employees come to build this garden made out of recycled um, hair care which is really cool. So they're above ground. Uh, Planning. Yep, yep, exactly. And um, the lumber here is created out of the recycled material. We've also included just kind of a holistic example to see how all of these aspects of what TerraCycle does kind of wraps into one. So um, highlighting for Breeze as one of our um, awesome partners. Um, so not only do they uh, recycle, they message their recyclability on pack. Um, they do a lot of engagement through marketing communications. Uh, but they also expand that. So they do um, in-store collection at some locations for uh, with retail partners, um, as well as ultimately culminate into larger promotions like the um, on the far right with the, their uh, win a playground promotion, where they had um, consumers uh, start to collect, and then the top collecting location was able to receive um, a playground made out of the recycled waste up for their community. So. This kind of goes in our example of so extraction and manufacturing to recycling, um, but then we also kind of want to send it right back to um, co complete that loop and kind of keep this material and these assets um, in our economy. So one way we've been able to do that is um, our new beach plastics program. So how this works, I'm sure you've all heard about um, the huge impact that waste and you know waste ending up in waterways and oceans is having on our planet um, so this is an opportunity for brands to kind of realize a problem and then provide a solution um, so one of our brand partners that have done this is head and shoulders and they do this through um, with TerraCycle we uh, run beach cleanup events um, where volunteers pick up plastic off of beaches and waterways, um, and then TerraCycle ultimately sorts that plastic, um, cleans it, shreds it, as you saw in our little examples, um, and helps these brands create new products out of that. So not only are they driving business value by saying, oh, we're being recyclable, but um, drawing to a specific issue, um, like the beach plastic issue. Um, so not only is this uh, engaging consumers, um, but they're able to garner huge media, media coverage um, and uh, 
marketing sustainability ROI um, by proving that their product is solving for this issue of waste. Mm -hmm. um, another example that we're super excited about here at Tire Cycle is um, the launch of Herbal Essences Beach Plastic. Um, containers, which just launched at Target, so everyone go restock your cabinets with some of this. Um, it's super cute, and it's made out of um, recycled beach plastic waste. So we've been excited about that for the past couple months because it's just launched. And then we're going to have Alicia back up again to talk about our newest uh, platform. Yeah, thanks, Lexus. Um, so I know hopefully everybody has heard a bit about Loop, um, if, but we're, we're here essentially to introduce up. Oh. Um, yeah, so we've got this is uh, cute. We'll flip to the next slide. Yes. So um, the platform just launched or was announced at the World Economic Forum in Davos, um, but in January, um, gone. So. To, in a nutshell, the, the idea is recycling is not really a, a, the answer, right? Like, the, we're not going to be able to recycle our way out of the, the issue that is the single use and, and wasteful nature of um, kind of the, the way things are structured today. So, um, we kind of took the logical progression in TerraCycle was to design into durable, reusable packaging. Um, and so loop, oh, I was just went back. Uh, uh, so uh, so the, it was just unveiled. Um, and so we'll be launching in May, so next month in New York and Paris. Um, it's starting kind of as a test and, and, and pilot learning um, strategy because it'll be about um, 5,000 households in the New York, uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania area and 5,000 households um, in the Paris metro area. But as you can see, the idea is to kind of really ramp up in those two markets towards the end of this year, um, with an, as well as opening up um, London uh, towards the back half of 2019, and then Toronto, San Francisco, Germany, and Tokyo in 2020 in time for the Olympics. Um, and so really, um, it's, mm -hmm. It's borrowing from the past um, and modernizing. I've heard our CEO say it's kind of like the milkman marries, marries Uber. That, that. <laughs> but if you think back to, to the milkman days, um, the, the packaging was an asset, right? It was something that um, the, the milk company owned, and so therefore you're incentivized to really invest and, and create something that's durable because the more uses you get, the more efficient it is, right? Um, but so then, this was a real advertisement, but an actual advertisement for when you know plastic and single use uh, became a really viable and cheap alternative to to what was the norm up until that point. Um, and so, if, when you think of things this way, really the trend line is is down because the the incentive when you as a consumer are paying, as part of your purchase price, the, the packaging, it's a cost of goods sold, the, from the manufacturer's perspective, they're incentivized to make that as cheap as possible. Um, so go ahead, Alexis. This, so this is kind of the trend line of what we've seen. Um, as, as, um, as the cost of packaging really goes down, and you do realize things like um, in some, some environmental impact when it comes to light weighting and, and all of these other types of concepts, um, ultimately you lose recyclability the further along this trend line you go because the, the, the pouches, um, the, it's multi layers and, and very, very difficult to recycle despite it being very cheap and, and easy to dispose of. So, the, how do we actually solve for the unintended consequences of disposability? while maintaining its virtues, right? Because in that previous photo, I mean, I don't know about you all, um, but it, oh, previous one, sorry, thanks. Um, I, I would much rather a glass bottle, right, over, over a pouch, so, it's the God bless, sorry. Um, so, the, the, the idea is that it's a fundamental cost of ownership, right? We're going from, these are just sample, sample prices here, but I wanted to give 
everybody an idea. The, way, the reality we live today in is that it's maybe a set 10 cents, right? That you are, you're, you're buying as the consumer and you have one use for this and it's on you to decide are you going to treasure that for the rest of your life or maybe you're throwing it in the recycling bin aspirationally or in the trash. Um, really shifting to uh, um, and where it's an asset to a brand, where you as the consumer are paying a deposit mm -hmm. to use the packaging that you never even wanted to own in the first place, mm -hmm. right? So that can really allow these companies to design for products that are meant to have 50, 100 reuses, and so can allow for so many different kind of design innovations, right? Like you, when you're when you're designing for durability, it opens up many many doors. Um, so we did bring some examples, but you can see um, some photos. So you we have the Hagen Daz. Uh, I'm actually a loop tester, so I, this is my own loop tote from home. Um, we have, for instance, the new Hagen Daz ice cream. Um, Packaging that is a thermos uh, that keeps your ice cream frozen for longer on the go. Um, there's also the Clorox disinfecting wipes uh, that's kind of in this durable, reusable canister that um, you can kind of has has more uh, wipes per per unit and uh, comes in this really cool. If you're passing along. Uh, and so, and so it's it's interesting. And, and full disclosure, Lexus and I, we, we both but really focus on the recycling side of the business. Um, so we we are also constantly learning new things about Loop as uh, as it, we reach closer to launch. I actually know. Oh, sorry. So this uh, one of the big questions that folks get give about Loop is well, aren't things going to get banged up? Like how how are you going to deal with that, right? And it's interesting because I think. The idea is to design into those types of issues, right? Like, so this Pantene bottle is a great example. So the, this this will be a, the 2020 <coughs> Pantene bottle, not what's being launched um, in May. But the you see a couple of layers here, right? So the inner kind of bottle is a, is a scratch-resistant material, mm -hmm. whereas the outer piece is like a scratch-attracting type of a, layer. So as the product gets used, it's kind of unearthing more and more of the branding that's underneath. So there's just, and it's, it's just starting, you know, I think that's the important thing uh, when it comes to loop. Uh, go ahead, Lexus. So the, the idea is it will be starting uh, as an e-commerce platform where you essentially buy products online, you pay a deposit mm -hmm. for each package, right? That So like the Haagen-Dazs, I think it's like a $3 deposit. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the cost of the, the product itself remains constant, comparable to the store. So once you kind of fill up your tote, you um, get this arrives at home. It's UPS. UPSs are um, a North American shipping partner, which is a durable, reusable tote. Um, with all of your products inside, you use, enjoy. I think the idea is to have a, a couple of loop totes in circulation because obviously you're not going to run through all of these different things like your Clorox wipes as quickly as your your ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so so the, the the premise is it's a, it's just as easy as throwing something away. If you have your durable package, when it's done, you just throw it into this tote. You don't have to wash or do anything. Um, once you are once the tote is full, you can set up the, the pickup. This gets sent to Loop. Um, reverse pickup, professionally cleaned, um, and then refilled by the partners, and everything loops loops around and around. Um, and so I think the, the idea is to also have uh, retail partners as well. Um, I know it's Carrefour in France. Um, and a, a couple of other partners that I'm not sure if we're able to disclose, but there, is, there are some well-known names that will also be integrating this into the retail environment. Um, so it will be something later in 2019 that will be part of how it scales up. Um,